Welcome to NYU Langone and, the, um, and our cancer center here. Uh, one of the things that we would like to do is um, get people to start thinking about how we can prevent disease so that we don't just go to a doctor when we're sick, but we also do whatever we can and go to a doctor when we're well. And colon cancer is such an interesting condition because it's one that we have really come very far in our treatment but also it's one of the most preventable of all cancers that we know of. And so this um, sort of two-edged sword, so to speak, is one that we're trying to really work on on both, on both sides. Okay. All right. That's better, right? For some reason. Okay, I'm going to take this off. I guess if you ask, can you hear me, and ask you to raise your hand, that's not the best way of figuring out whether someone can hear you in the back or not. Um, sorry about that. Okay. So what we have is a paradox in colorectal cancer. Colon cancer is the number two cause of cancer-related death in this country. Um, anybody know what number one is? Lung cancer, actually. Lung. Lung is still number one. And even whether smoking makes it worse, but even um, lung, both smokers and non-smokers. And um, colon cancer is one of the most preventable and curable of cancers that we know of. So we have this paradox, and it's one that we really uh, want to try and uh, get rid of. So what is colorectal cancer? It's cancer or adenocarcinoma of either the colon, the rectum, or the junction in between. It develops initially on the wall of the colon. By the way, the colon is the large intestine. What actually, I, I surprised my uh, students today. I, I gave a lecture to the interns this morning, and um, they didn't recognize the fact that colon cancer is so common, but intestinal cancer, that is of the small intestine, what connects the stomach to the colon, is one of the rarest of cancers. So it's a, and yet it's connected. You know, we're one long tube from top to bottom. So it's really unusual to see um, such a difference. And there are a lot of theories, part of it being the fact that there's all the bacteria primarily in the colon and not in the small intestine. Um, so anyway, the cancer develops initially on the wall of the colon, and then it grows into the wall, eventually goes to lymph nodes, and can spread to other uh, organs such as the liver. Uh, we believe every cancer actually starts from a polyp, and we'll talk about this, and you'll hear more from Dr. Cohn. But not every polyp turns cancerous. Very important distinction. Um, and that when the polyp starts, it starts benign. And that over time, some of these polyps will turn cancerous. We think there's a window of opportunity of possibly 10 or 15 years from when the polyp starts to when the cancer develops. So very rare do you have an intervention in a cancer where you can intervene so early, 10 years early, and prevent a cancer that can develop further down the road. So what are the risk factors? Well, first of all, the biggest risk factor is not having any fat risk factors at all, meaning that you're feeling well and um, you're just going through your life um, being healthy, and the main risk factor is actually um, making sure that you're proactive and when you're well to really start thinking about this. Um, but in terms of things that actually put you at higher risk, because that's what an average risk, would really be a family history of either large polyps or cancer. If your parents, if your siblings, have had either colon cancer or large polyps, that puts you at increased risk. And the younger they are when they have that um, polyps or cancer, the higher the risk it puts you at. Um, if there is inflammatory bowel disease, there's a connection in cancer of chronic inflammation and cancer that's not just in the uh, colon, but it's in almost every cancer. For example, patients with hepatitis have an increased risk of liver cancer, um, particularly when they develop cirrhosis. Patients with colitis or inflammatory bowel disease, if not treated, have an increased risk of colon cancer. Um, and then if there's a genetic predisposition, there are conditions known as Lynch or FAP um, that you may have heard about. HNPCC is another one. Not going to get into the specifics, but if there's a familial cancer um, situation, that puts you at increased risk. So everyone should be screened for colorectal cancer starting age 50 for average risk. Those are healthy people without any of these higher risk components. But if there's a um, family history, you might start at age 40 or 10 years younger, and certainly even younger if there's a genetic syndrome. What about lifestyle? Actually, we have now a lot of evidence that there are certain factors that are listed that can increase the risk of not only colorectal cancer, but many cancers. Um, smoking, 
a lot of red meat, and not, not occasional. Um, this is really just frequent red meat. Um, some people eat red meat every night. Um, being sedentary, actually just walking. Um, some studies suggest walking 15 minutes a day, or you may have heard about the 10,000 steps. Not only is it a beneficial effect for preventing colorectal cancer, but it's good for everything. It's good for your heart, it's good for your circulation, good for your blood pressure, and also good for your mood. One of the things I love about working at NYU Langone is that I'm walking from the VA to Bellevue to Tisch to our office on 38th to the Cancer Center. I'm walking all around. And just by working and walking, it makes me feel healthier. Um, and also avoiding obesity. I mean, obesity itself is a risk, again, for many things, including colorectal cancer. Um, so let's go with the first uh, question. This is a click. Um, let's see how I do this. How do I, did I hit polling open? So who gets colorectal cancer? Um, men, women, or both? Now it's not that who only gets. This is who gets it more. Do you think colorectal cancer is really more a male disease? Do you think it's really more a female disease? Or both would be pretty much equal? Are we open for polling? Yes, I guess we can. You raised your hand. How did you do that? We just submitted the certificate a couple months ago. So. Yeah. Can we sing like the Jeopardy song? <laughs> do, 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 do. Um, okay. All right. Yeah, you guys are a smart group. That is correct. It's really, this is an equal opportunity disorder. Although I will tell you, as you can see here, a few of you think a, a little bit more male than female. And I think the reason for that is that um, I think men talk about their colons more. But um, by and large, every, we all, both men and women have colons, and um, there is a little bit of a difference in polyps. Actually, um, men have more polyps than women, but in cancer, it's pretty much uh, split. So men and women both get it. All right, very good. All right, here's the next one. No, wait, do I, to get this going again, just hit the left? Yep, that's why you have the right one. Okay, polling is open. What percentage of colorectal cancers are diagnosed at age 50 or over? A is 25%, B 50%, C 60%, and D 90%. It's one of these. These are the questions I hated when I was, you know, going through school. I, these, I, I would just want to scream because you know the answer, but you know, is it really so close? All right, you guys, you guys set? All right, let's see. Okay, interesting. Got a little split here. So it looks like the majority think about 60%. Um, are uh, 50 or above. And what's also interesting is that we have a bunch of people who think that actually more cancers are diagnosed be below the age of 50. So the actual answer is 90%, okay, which is why our screening recommendations are above 50. But I'm going to put a little asterisk to this question because actually what we've seen in alarming rates over the past decade is an increase in the number of young people with colorectal cancer. Just yesterday we diagnosed a 23-year-old with colorectal cancer, probably has a familial genetic syndrome. But we're seeing it in younger patients so much so and in such alarming rates that we have a uh, now focus group at the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable aimed at younger people. That being said, it's still the minority of colorectal cancer. The majority of colorectal cancer is 50 and above, which is why average risk screening should start at 50. Now, if someone has a family history or some of the other high risk in, um, components that we discussed, then of course, that would be a different situation. But this is for average risk patients, it's 90% uh, 50 and above. Okay, true or false, most people who get colorectal cancer have a family history of this disease. Polling is now open. Do, do, do. Sorry. How many people let, watch that show, Jeopardy, by the way? That's a great show. Yeah. Okay. This is an easy one. It's just an A or B. A is true, B or false. Okay. Well, um, false is, is right. So most people who get colorectal cancer do not have a family history. The minority of people, um, and the average of average um, casual family history, it's about 25%. Um, for people who have true genetic syndrome, it's somewhere between 5 and 7%. So actually, the majority of people who get colorectal cancer are over the age of 50 and have no family history. And this is why it's always painful to hear someone saying, well, I didn't get screened because I have no family history. 
That's not the case. That's more of a reason you're at more risk in a certain way, just percentage-wise, of developing cancer um, as a population. As an individual, if you have a family history, you have an increased risk. But for the overall demographics, people without a family history are the majority of people who get colorectal cancer. Okay. So, as we said, both men and women get colorectal cancer. Hey, that's kind of fun, by the way, those clickers. I really like that. Um, I hope you guys like that as well. It definitely keeps the audience awake, that's for sure. Um, so both men and women get colon cancer. Um, it is all different ethnicities. Everybody develops it. Actually, interesting study, there is a decreased incidence of colorectal cancer in some of the Asian countries. However, when you see the immigration um, and people become... Um, uh, live in the U.S. for a number of years. They follow the Japanese cohort. The risk start to, the population percentages start to increase. So it, it spans all racial and ethnic backgrounds. Also, interestingly, it seems to be uh, starting at a younger age in African Americans and possibly even a little more aggressive. Um, again, as we said, mostly it's no family history, and the people who have a family history are at increased risk. So how do we prevent this? So. The number one way to prevent it is through screening, and the time to screen is when you're well. So we talked about this concept of all cancers come from a polyp, and that the polyp dwells somewhere between 10 to 15 years before it may turn cancerous. Again, not all polyps turn cancerous, but we believe all cancers in average risk patients come from polyps. So the concept of prevention, and it's very simple, is we go in and we find a polyp and remove it, we could prevent the cancer. And that's the prevention message. The cure message is if we go in at a time where this pink diagram represents colon cancer and this yellow line represents the wall, if the colon cancer is early, it hasn't breached the wall of the colon yet, there's no um, lymph nodes or organ involvement. Actually, when we remove this, and sometimes we could even remove this by colonoscopy, but even if we remove this surgically, it's a very high instance of cure. So this is a very highly curable area. However, and by the way, most of the time, this is asymptomatic. So patient comes in for screening. We just had this the other day, and we found an early cancer. I tell patients it's their lucky day because most of the time this is going to be a cured um, condition. However, when it starts becoming symptomatic, people start bleeding, they have pain, obstruction. Not only has it often breached the wall, but often you have lymph node involvement and maybe even further organ disease, and then it becomes harder to treat. Still could be curable, by the way. I want to make it very clear. And Dr. Cohen will talk to you about some of the treatments and new interventions. But it's more difficult to cure this situation than it is this. And again, the value of screening and prevention. This is screening and colon cancer and finding it early and preventing it is by finding a polyp and removing it. So screening is done when you have no symptoms, true or false. Polling is open. Screening is done when you have no symptoms. Is that a true statement? Press A. It's a false statement. Press B. Okay, that is correct. Screening is done when you have no symptoms. Now, if you have symptoms, that's actually called a diagnostic procedure. So not only do we want to screen people when they have no symptoms, but if we're actually doing a colonoscopy, for example, because they have rectal bleeding or they have abdominal pain, that's being done diagnostically, being done to figure out what's causing the symptom, what's causing the problem, whereas screening it should be done on healthy patients. Good. You guys are doing well. All right, so who should, we, who should get screened and when? Um, we talked about men and women starting at age 50, and screening should be done when you feel well. And that's really against the American paradigm of going to a doctor. You usually go to a doctor when you're sick. In this condition, we could prevent colon cancer if you go to a doctor when you're well. And that's why prevention, preventative health, starts really with your general practitioner, not your gastroenterologist or your oncologist. It's really your general practitioner. Okay, and what kind of screening do we have available? Well, there are a lot of guidelines, um, but the consensus guidelines basically recommend these tests. Um, and they range from being minimally invasive to um, more invasive. The FOBT or FIT, this is called fecal immunochemical test or fecal occult blood test. This is the test that's done on the stool looking for microscopic blood. This is not blood that you actually see in the stool or in the toilet water. This is microscopic. 
It's actually very simple. Often you use a paintbrush. You don't have to touch the feces. It, the stool is touched and then um, sent off to a lab and the doctor gets the result. It needs to be done every year. This is not effective if it's not done every year. And actually is very good for detecting cancer, about 70 to 75% or so. Not that great for detecting polyps. But if you're gonna do nothing, this is the best thing to do other than doing nothing. There's no excuse not to do something because this is so easy. Flexible sigmoidoscopy is still recommended every five years. It's really sort of fallen away to doing a colonoscopy. And you know a colonoscopy looks at the entire large intestine, and if colonoscopy is found to have a polyp, it's removed right there and then. What we say is one-stop shopping. The reason a flexible sigmoidoscopy isn't done as often, if you're gonna get a flexible sigmoidoscopy, you may as well have the whole colon looked at. People have likened it to doing a mammography on one breast. That being said, flexible sigmoidoscopy can be done without sedation. Again, better than nothing. CT colonography is the new kid on the block. It should be done every five years. And um, it's basically a CAT scan with a three-dimensional reconfiguration that gives you a good look at the colon. The problem with CT colonography, and the reason it hasn't been picked up, one, not all insurances cover it. Two, you still have to take the same bowel prep as the colonoscopy. And three, if you find a polyp, you then need to be referred for the colonoscopy. So, uh, and there could be a, a upwards to a 40% chance of a polyp. So a lot of people just go on to get the colonoscopy. But there are reasons that CT might be better if you're on anticoagulation, for example, or if the colonoscopy is very difficult. And how many of you heard of Cologuard as a test? Okay, so a few of you. Cologuard is the new DNA stool test combined. It's actually a combination of DNA and FIT. Its cancer, uh, its ability to detect cancer is upwards to 90%. It's very good. Still not great in finding polyps, 40% or so. So um, the problem with the Cologuard is, again, its expenses, it could be um, three to $500, and it might not be covered by insurance. The FIT, on the other hand, which I mentioned is 70% or so effective in cancer, is uh, only about $25. Um, if you ask me or most people in this field what they recommend, what they do for themselves and for the family members, it's colonoscopy. But the best test, and this is the message, is the one that gets done. If someone's not going to have a colonoscopy, they should have, at a minimum, the FIT or the FOBT. Um, colonoscopy, if normal, no polyps, is a 10-year interval. This is a new recommendation, a guideline, um, which people don't realize. It only needs to be done once every decade if no polyps are found. And this is the only test that can actually prevent cancer because if it finds a polyp, it removes it and prevents it. Um, truthfully, the data is spectacular in terms of uh, cancer prevention. We've actually seen a decrease in colorectal cancer incidence by 30% over the past decade. And we think it's mainly due to screening and doing colonoscopy and removing polyps. This is an incredible win for public health. And to see this disease starting to really plummet is very exciting. This is what a polyp looks like. It's flat, um, and when it's removed, we put a loop of wire around it, and it looks like a, a little white um, remnant, which is where the current had caused the cautery mark, and that heals, and you won't even see that polyp uh, in the future. This is a polyp on a stalk. Here's the polyp. This is the colon. And what we do is we put a loop of wire right here and we just cut it off. And this is all normal tissue. And when you go back in a year or three years, depending on the follow-up, you won't even know a polyp was ever there. You might see a little scar. Um, how do we make sure we have good quality and access? Make sure your gastroenterologist has experience and training in colonoscopy. You could ask him or her how many they've done, how many polyps they find, that's all fair. And we have some new technologies here um, that we're studying, but regular colonoscopy is highly effective. But we're looking at a colonoscope called full spectrum that has three cameras, a little cuff that's at the end trying to look behind the folds for polyps, using a balloon. We haven't started this yet, but the idea came from um, our investigators. And we actually have a pill. This is the American dream of screening, a capsule that you could swallow that can take pictures of the colon. But you still have to take the very rigorous prep. So it's unclear where that's going to fall. But we're looking at different uh, opportunities. The other thing that's very exciting is that we have a trial starting very soon that's going to do colonic irrigation, like the high colonic enemas that people get for um, you know, in health spas and other areas. It actually is pretty good at cleaning the colon. It might be used as a bowel prep as an alternative to drinking that terrible prep. 
So we're looking forward. I know you guys love, listen, I've had two colonoscopies myself. I haven't done them myself. I've had them done, but I have to tell you, I'm with you guys. That bowel prep is just miserable, but the procedure's kind of nice. You know, you feel kind of relaxed and those graham crackers are awesome afterwards. I don't know if you get that the, they shouldn't be called crackers. They should be called cookies. They're much more a cookie than a cracker, but that's another story. Anyway, um, often with colon cancer, no symptoms. It may overlap with other things, irritable bowel syndrome, um, malabsorption. Some people who are lactose intolerant will get bloating and diarrhea. Um, but the things to really look out for, you've heard about some of these, blood in the stool, um, when there's a change and a persistent change, particularly a narrowing of the stool where it looks like it's much thinner and longer. Um, unexplained weight loss, unexplained abdominal pain. These things, you shouldn't say, oh my God, I have cancer. What you should do is be evaluated by a physician. Um, but it's very important that you see a doctor, um, no matter what age, whether you have symptoms or not, just to make sure that you stay healthy. Um, get screened when you feel well, because polyps and early cancer cause absolutely no symptoms. In fact, that's the time to get the evaluation. And even if you find out that you have nothing, it wasn't a waste, it's a nice peace of mind to know that everything's healthy with inside your body. And the other thing is very important. We have these pins, these colorectal cancer awareness pins. Please recognize that these mean we should all be aware of colorectal cancer and how we can prevent it, but not only for ourselves, but for the people who matter in our lives. Please get everybody screened if they're 50 and over. They should do something. There's no excuse not to get screened, even if it's just that fecal cult blood test. Thank you very much.